Now, I am the owner of a guest house in Simriep province and also I'm a tour organizer for Angkor Complex in Simriep. So, a little bit, yeah, inform you that if you want to go Simriep, you can stay with me. And also, <laughs> I also am a tour guide also for many years, okay? Um, so in addition of this, my family and I supported the children to go to school. Why we are doing this? Because we know that school is the answer to all problems or the poverty. School is the answer to everything. I was born in 1962 in the educated family. My father, picture here with a white shirt. My father was a teacher in the, in the high school. At that time, my house is not inside the town in Simrib. My house is about three kilometers far from the town. And I went to the school nearby my house. I was very, very happy during that time because my family at that time was very good. The teacher at that time made good money and respectful. So, yeah, very, I was very happy. But life changed. Before the war, everybody want to marry their children or their, their, or their daughter to the teachers. But life changed. Why? Hmm? Oh, okay. The war come to Cambodia. This is the influence of the war in Vietnam. I think maybe you know about that. Do we have Vietnamese people in this, in here, in the room? Yeah. I think we all suffer with this war. Vietnam, the, from the north, supported by communists. And the southern Vietnam, supported by U.S. They fought with each other, and the northern Vietnamese troop made the Ho Chi Minh Trail across our country at the border. An American air fighter bombed in our country every day to chase the northern Vietnamese soldier and not allow them to fight against the southern Vietnam. So our country was the victim. And then our country at that time was neutral, but we had a king. Our king, Rodam Sihano, he went abroad to negotiate with communist bloc and capitalist bloc to stop the war in our country. But when he was on the way out of the country, American helped the General Lonnol to make a coup d'etat to f overthrow the King Rodam Siano. I think you know coup d'etat, right? Coup d'etat taken power by using the army. Then, Khmer Rouge, that one was a small political party. But because of the coup d'etat, and because of the Vietnamese from the north coming into the country, so the Khmer Rouge, they joined with Vietnamese troops who also communist. 
and convinced the people to join with them to fight against the government of the coup d'etat. I can tell you that 90% of people in the countryside love the king. So to get the king back, they all participate with the war and get Khmer Rouge's party become bigger. Some people, they confuse Khmer Rouge is what Khmer, but Khmer Rouge is only the name of the political party who are communist. Then, The government of the coup d'etat with American help and also Vietnamese from the south helping also. So we call Viet Cong for the north and Viet Minh for the south. Then the war started. When the war started, When the war started, we, do, we didn't have school. All schools stopped. In the countryside, no school, even in the town. At the beginning, in the town, no school neither. And the air fighter dropped the bomb everywhere in the whole country. You can see the red spot here. That the place where the landmine clearer, they found the bomb, like the rocket from the sky. Some not working, stay still over there. And some place, only the pieces that we found. And the landmine clearer, they made the map and then made the spot. But I curious a little bit because my town is here. Siem Reap. With my eyes, as a child, I saw the air fighter shooting in Anko area, in the temples area also, and bomb also there. And I saw the forest burn, but the landmine killer didn't see anything, maybe not a lot of red spot in there. But that's okay, no problem. I know that. I'm the witness. But you know, as a child, before the war, in Cambodia, we didn't see a, a lot of airplanes. But during the war, we see a lot of airplanes in the sky, and we see the, the airplanes shooting to the ground in the nighttime with the beautiful artif artificial light, the bullet, and the children found beautiful and applauded. But our parents, our grandparents, worry every day. They worry about the war. But children know nothing. Only, you know, happy all the time. Khmerus said that whoever could kill or catch a teacher could get paid at that time in real, it equal about $1,500 at that time. Or a teacher's wife could get about $1,000. Or a teacher's child, $500. But it's cost in real, but I convert into US dollar for you because you don't know the real at that time or maybe you don't know the real event right now in Cambodia. So my uncle worried about us very much, and he lived in the countryside in another province. He came to take us to live with him, with his family. I remember the place is out in the countryside, and from his house, I saw the chain of the mountain like this. And the war became worse and worse. The road between provinces were cut 
by the bomb, by the landmines. Many Khmer Rus, many Viet Cong along the road. And American bomber bomb everywhere. So our father worried a lot about us and worry about our education too. So he hired someone to go there to take us back after living with our uncle for several months, back to Simrip. Oh. So this is Simrip at that time. If you go to Simrip now, you cannot recognize it. Not the same as in this photo. Back to the town. We were very happy again to go back to school. Very happy. But life in fear all the time too. Life become very expensive. That our father's salary could not support the family anymore. Even before the war, his salary could feed even 20 people. But during the war, even our family, only five people cannot have enough to eat. And also we don't have home. When we came back from our uncle, we could not go back to our home which is only three kilometers from the town. Do you know why? Because the town was very small, occupied by the government of the coup d'etat. It's about 1.8 kilometers by two kilometers only. And outside the town is the battlefield. The Khmerus, Viet Cong, are there, attacked each other all the time. So we could not live there. And we need to hire an apartment to live that even the salary cannot afford. So my father and my mom decided to open a bookshop in the market. It's now it's the old market. Whoever been in Cambodia in Simrip, no old market. So our shop, bookshop in there. My mom could do that, I incredible, because in her life, she went to school only one year, but she's lucky to marry to my father who was a teacher. And my father liked reading for her and liked reading for the children and make my mom like reading too. Living in a town, we were very scared also. The granite exploded almost every day and everywhere. Sometimes in the market, sometimes in the cinema. Our parents not allow us to go to the cinema, but as we are children and they're busy, they could not con control us. So we just follow the other people to get inside the cinema, even though we didn't have money, but we pretended to be the children of the others who went inside the cinema. And when the granite exploded, our father ran around in the town looking for us. It's painful. And also, from the temple area, the Khmerus, they shot the motor shell to the town. Over there, we have the hill, and on the top of the hill, you can see the town easily. But it could not shot a lot. Just one or two shells, the air fighter went there and then drop the bomb there. If you go to temples in Cambodia, you see a lot of bullet holes, even the biggest temple, Angkor Wat, that the people respect a lot. A lot of the hole, the bullet hole. 
absolutely like that. Until one day, the 17th of April, 1997, when American withdrew from Vietnam. It's no point for American stay in Cambodia, right? So Khmer Rouge got the victory, got the power. The Vietnamese from the north went back home because they got independent from American. They went on the southern Vietnam. Leaving Khmer Rouge in a town in Cambodia, but Khmer Rouge is Khmer, so they stay in Cambodia is no more. And the first day, when they came into town, everybody believed that no more war in our country. Everybody happy, applauded. But the first day in the morning, the Khmer Rouge, they called for the soldiers, the U.S. back soldier who work for the Lonol government, the, the government of the coup d'etat, to join the meeting, talking about how to build the country, how to protect the country. It would be, they say that it would be uh, American bomb our country, so all of us soldiers come to, to join and talk about that. And all soldiers, I don't know about soldiers in other towns, but I know about soldiers in my town, Siem Reap, went to the meeting forever. My neighbor, a commander of the army, he went and then disappeared. He didn't come back. And then, so, this is Pol Pot. He put out of education, put it into the education, to the private enterprise, to everything, and chase everybody out from the town. Pol Pot, his name, but his real name is not Pol Pot. Do you know his real name? Whoever in this room know his real name? Could you tell? His real name is Salot Sol, right? Do you know the meaning of Pol Pot? Pol Pot is his nickname. It's not the name that his parents or his grandparents gave him. But he gave this name to himself. P-O-T from the word potential. P-O-L from the word politic. That means politic potential. Pol Pot is a good name powerful name, but look. He chased everybody out from the town. He didn't allow anyone to take any transportation with. So everyone had to carry things on the head, on the shoulder, and he made us who walk very far. This is the picture that taken in 1979. We walked very far. The place where I lived during the killing field time is about 60 kilometers from Siem Reap. But we walked more than two weeks to get there. We dropped all the belonging on the way because we become heavier and heavier. And on the way, we were thirsty, and we ran toward to the hollow where there was the water. And when we raised, after drinking that, we raised up like this, we saw the dead people, the dead body around too. It's very hard, but no choice. We had to be survived. And when we got to that place, they forced us to work worse than the animal. Why I say that worse than the animal? 
because the animal, when they work, they have grass to eat. And the people work, need rice, need food, but no food. I ate what I found. Worm, cricket, grasshopper, everything. The baby frog or mother frog or grandparents frog, I don't care. I ate all. And the people over there who participated with Khmeros before, they always keep their eyes on us. They accuse us like CIA because we were with the government supported by US. Then when they found teachers or doctors, educated people, they told the soldiers and the soldier came to kill. One day, oh no, one more thing. My family separated also. Me and another uh, sister, number two, after me, I'm the oldest. We were separated from the family to work with the children group, far from home. My father also separated from the family to work with the men group. And my mom worked in the village because she has small children. And one day in 1977, I remember very well, they collected all the new families in a prison camp. The prison camp was a pagoda. And me, I went there too. But I went there the day be after the other people arrived. And when I got there, my mom told me that I was too late to see my father. He saw, she saw my father because all together and then split. My father was called with other teachers in that place and other men to the meeting forever. And we could not get her, him back. In the prison camp, I saw people die every day. Some die because of starving. Some die because of being killed. Why starving? Our fathers left 350 women and children in the hands of those soldiers. Could you guess how many soldiers killed all the teachers? Two soldiers, one 13 years old and one 16 years old. And all the teachers didn't do anything against them. Just stay still for them to, to kill them. And then they gave us to eat only about one kilogram of rice for all of us, 350 people per day. So they put the rice in the big pot, like the big pot, and pour the water in and then boil it like the porridge. And if you're in the row, you're in the front, you could get only the water. And if you're in the middle or at the back, when you turn, no more porridge. They said, sorry, finish. Two weeks after we arrived to that prison camp, we started to bury the dead people. In the morning, the soldier arrived. Okay, how many dead people today? You, you stay here, bury them. And when you finish, go to the field. Sometimes, at the beginning, not many died. But after that, 10, 15. But we were in the prison camp only, only six feet. The inner six feet, only 
102 survived. The inner six feet, they came to us. They said that, okay, we can free you now. We give you one day or two days free. You could go anywhere. And then we went to the village where the old villagers are there, begging rice from them to eat. And some of us ate too much and died. Five people out of 102 died because of eating too much, include one of my sister. Talking about my sister, I feel guilty. My sister, she didn't die by herself because she didn't eat by herself. Me and another sister gave her to eat. If we both were selfish, she could not die. But she's only five months old and she opened her mouth and swallow and we just drop, 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 drop the food in her mouth and too much. But other people, older, even one mother ate too much and died too. So five died because of eating too much. That at night. Once in the daytime, during lunchtime, as I told you that sometimes we could have something to eat, sometimes they said, no, finish. One boy, very hungry, and saw a little, a little frog jumping, and he tried to catch the frog and pass the border because they limit the place for us to stay, to live, and no fence, no wall. So it's easy to pass because of the frog. And so just came, what are you doing here? I wanted to catch a frog. If you could have a frog, what would you do with the frog? I would eat it. How? Cook or raw? You know the answer of the boy? He said that cooked. So instead of the frog was cooked by the boy, the boy was cooked by the soldier. Alive. Tie again the coconut tree in front of everybody. In front of his mother too. Me too, everybody saw that. But you know, to be alive, to survive. We pretended see nothing. But that image stays still in my brain. When I talk to you, I go back to that time. Now. It's not easy. But, you know, how to spread this new so that not or no event like this happen in the world. And many other things happen in there. My brother walking on the like on the walkway nearby the like in the rice field and the soldier came and then on the horse come pass by and then beat him with his whip. And he fell in the field and they laugh. Like they kill people or they torture the people for fun. At the beginning, they kill the people because they were educated. But after that, they do that for fun. So killing field is like this. I lost many members of my family who live in another areas, in other areas in Cambodia too. My uncles, my aunties, my grandparents were, die, were like die because some of them 
die because of starving and some of them because of being killed for many other reasons. But at last, three years, eight months, and 20 days, Camaro's power was finished. We get Vietnamese coming to chase them from the power because some of the Camaros, they were not happy with killing people, escaped to Vietnam. When they used to work together during the war against Americans, so they know each other, and then they got Vietnamese troops coming to rescue us from the killing field. But Vietnamese occupy our country for 10 years. Colonization. We used to have that 100 years during French colonization. And during Vietnamese occupation, also we have a good thing that we can be survived from killing fear, but we have also some bad thing also. But however, if I don't have Vietnamese soldier coming to chase Khmeros out of the, out of the power, my family could be killed too because we were already in the list to go to the meeting. The word meeting of the Khmeros, that means go to be killed. They built a kiln, you know kiln? Like the big stove for, for the brick, to make the brick. And in that mountain, the doorway at the same level of the dirt truck. And they fill the people on in the dirt truck, carry them there, and pour the people alive in the fire. And they use the ashes to fertilize the rice field. And my family already in the list. Maybe God know that I need to share the experience to you and keep me alive. Oh, I was killed once. I was accused of a thief. I was very skinny. They sent me to the hospital. But in that hospital, we sleep on the ground next to each other too. And one old man prepared a medicine, medicine what, medical help for us. But many people died in there also. I was um, accused of the thief because they found one cassava in my, uh, in my bag. And that one was given by someone who knew my father. I didn't eat all the same time. I saved piece by piece to continue my life. And I found it. And then tie me, take me to the forest and make me digging my own grave. They make me lie down on the ground and they measure me and then make me digging the grave. And because I was very skinny, no energy, I dug maybe only like this and then I felt unconscious. And then when, when I woke up, I found I lie on my back and a lot of dust on me. Maybe I stopped reading for a while. They thought that I I died, maybe. But I didn't have any way to go. I went back to the same place. But I went to the man who prepared a herb for us. And he like he believed me that um, I was innocent. So he put me in the uh, the herb room, keep me in there. And he had enough to eat, so he shared his food to me. Four days after, the same thief came out. The same thief. The thief stole fish from someone in the building. And then they saw that, and then they shouted, thief, thief, thief. 
and then he ran away to the forest. He just about one step from the forest, soldier came with his gun and shot. That one completely died. And a few days after, I could get out from that place because I was innocent. But I didn't dare to meet the soldiers. When I saw him, saw them like this, I walked this way, pretended not to see. Yeah. So that our life, this is some example. I cannot tell you all everything because I have limit time. It's almost time. And also maybe you have some question because it repeat the same thing. Killing, killing, killing. Okay, so we continue to this. After three years, eight eight months and twenty days, we could come back to Simrip. This is my old house and we have my mom, my sister Marina, my sister Sotira, my brother Dara, and this one our neighbor. He's the owner of this elephant. He has two elephants, but they like coming to our house because we grow sugar cane. And this elephant like going to the ankle park to look for the wood for the kitchen and share with us also, because that one eat our sugar cane. One day, one day, the husband elephant stepped on the landmines, and he died. And his wife, even we gave her the good part of the sugar cane, she, she didn't eat, and she died too. So the war, you know, not only destroy the people, but even animals and even the nature, the forest burn every day, every day because of the bomb, because of everything. The consequence to my family, very difficult for our life. My mom worked very hard to raise the children alone without her husband. If her husband with her, educated man could help her a lot, but she didn't have a good education. So she worked very hard to raise us. We are very lucky because mom smart could keep us secretly from the soldiers. She could raise us. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The end of six weeks, the soldier came to my mom and asked my mom, Savat, we want to know why the other people's children die almost all, and your children stay still alive. How you could keep them alive? My mom said, I don't know. Why you don't know? And then my mom, she always made the fire to warm us. Because if it's too cold, we could die. So she warmed us with the fire. And it took the piece of wood with the fire and then burned my mom in here. You know, I wish to have my mom sit here watching me, talking to you. But I didn't think about that. Now I, I thought about, I think about that, you know. She's the one who remember well, and she's the one who suffer very much. And they use the horse whip to meet my mom, and her back is blood like this. And all of us pretended to be asleep, to be asleep. Pretended nothing happened on our mom. Pretended not to listen to her scream because of the pain. Yeah. This is our mom, great mom. So she worked very hard. 
Sometimes she go to Phnom Penh to work for two months, and me, I'm the eldest, look after everybody. We were very poor, and I dream, and I told when we had dinner, if I have a lot of money, the first thing I want to do is eating one chicken alone. <laughs> My sister Marina, she was five years old. She came to me, sister, sister. But we sit like around like this, and she crawl like this, come to me. Sister, could you share your chicken with me? I said, no, I want to eat alone, you hear me? And she throw the spoon and the, the spoon and the plate on me. And our neighbor heard the noise like they shoot in the, in the house and they know that we don't have mother of it. They came to grab my sister away from me and then, you know, feed her there. Well, and at night time she came back and then scroll inside the mosquito, mosquito net and lie down on my side and then, sister, sister, you are so mean. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry. I will share the chicken. That one just a dream, not the real one. If I had a real one, I really share with you. And then she hold me and she sleep, fall asleep. Cute. Now, she's the cook in the house. And she said, and also she's a tour guy. She said that whoever want to eat one chicken alone, I can cook for. Even two or three, I don't mind, I cook for. But the problem is I'm not allergic of chicken. Could, could not, could not get chicken. And this is the picture of my sisters, Tiara and me. The one, okay, I think you recognize me and this is so Tiara. At that time, we were very poor, and she got the fever very serious with her friends. Her friends had the money and get to uh, a doctor and get injection and then die. And my sister, no money to go to the doctor, and then we just used the ashes to put on her body and put the water in to cool down the heat. But after that, she woke up after three days and she lost her hearing and she lost the balance. But she's smart to kill her time, not kill herself because of that. She studied Thai language by herself and she studied English by herself. She helped me a lot. And now she's the IT or manager for our program. She control all IT labs in our program in five different schools. She built her lesson very well, put in a computer, and the student came and sit down, open it, see the lesson, no need to ask the teacher, all explain in there how to copy all the lesson. After finished copying, know how to work with that. She's smart. Okay. Because all the educated people, all the teachers, most, mostly all the teachers were killed by Khmerus. And the government called for the one who know a little bit share the knowledge with the one who know nothing. The one who know more share the knowledge like to each other. So I went to the training school, teacher training school, to be trained as a teacher for three months, even though I had only seven years of education before genocide. Do we have Russian people in here? <laughs> Thrust with you? <laughs> uh, so I studied Russian language in Phnom Penh, and all the teachers 
in a primary school during the break time, the holy like the holidays for three months. They had to go to university in Phnom Penh also to study, to continue their knowledge, to continue their with their students. Like we teach grade six in the uh, holidays, we go there to study with Vietnamese teachers about mathematics for grade seven, about chemistry for grade seven, about physics for grade seven, and come back, teach grade seven. Break time again, go again, learning about how to teach grade eight. Sometimes the students stronger than the teachers because they are smart, they can make it many ways to resolve the problem. You know. But anyway, we had to do that when all the teachers were gone. My mom. My sister, one of well, Marina, Savannah, and Dara could make themselves to go back to school. The other three cannot. And my mom opened the bookshop again because she had the experience for the bookshop when I started to be a teacher. And she stopped going around in the whole country to work. She just stayed in the same spot in Zimrip and opened the bookshop. And then make my sister and brother read all the books in the shop and give the report to her which book for which grade. Even Marina said grade one, that are grade two and so on are grade five. And she need to read grade six, grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, whatever book that she had. And make them very strong in the school. And then I went to Russia for one for one year to be trained as a teacher. I think if you are Russian, you know this one in Russia. You see the picture of Lenin at the back. So when I come back from Russia and stay in Phnom Penh for one year more, in 1990, 1991 I finished, but 1990, United Nations peacekeeper came to our country. Vietnamese troops withdrew from our country. United Nations peacekeeper came to help us for the election, the first election after the war or something. So 1993, we could have the election. But Khmer Rouge, they didn't participate with the election at all. During the time of Vietnamese occupation and then, we have many other political parties, all of them came to join the election. But Khmer Rouge, not. Do you know why? Because they knew that no one voted for them. No one voted for them. So they stay in the forest, fighting against the government of the coup d'etat. No, the coup d'etat, not. The government elected. Coup d'etat is, okay, the elected government. They accused our government, like always, about oh the government of Vietnam or something like that. But you know, we have our own soldiers already. We don't have any more Vietnamese soldiers in the country, but they still accuse us. But I don't care about politics. So Election happened 1993, but the war continued until 1998. 1994, French Center, Alliance Francais, was opened in Simrim. I forgot to tell you that I learned French and my father spoke French. And I learned English when I was a teacher in primary school, but secretly because French English not allowed to learn, only Russian 
and Vietnamese allowed to learn. When I came back from Russia, got the diploma as a teacher, Russian language teachers, and went back to school. And the school said that, the director said that, Punyiri, if you speak only Russian, you stay in the corner, work in the office. And then I show, oh, I speak English and French too. So I chose to be English teacher with the diploma from Russia. Because at that time, not many people speak English, so I could do that. I was already, you know, always lucky. Then, when French Center opened, I went to the French Center to study, but the director of the French Center found I speak already a little bit French, so he offered me a, uh, to teach the beginners. And I got a scholarship to go to France, only for two months to be trained as a teacher and teaching French in the French Center in Siem uh, Reap. So this is my photo in Toulouse, in France. In, Fr in France. Then, 1998. Oh, why I saw the picture of 1998 when I went to France? Because 1998 is a time, important time for us, too. Khmer finished in 1998. April 1998, Pol Pot died peacefully, surrounded by his family in his house at the border. Different from my father. No one could get him to the court. And he died peacefully. I'm jealous. And that year is the year for the second election. The election, the end of July, 27, I think. But I went to France, July and August, so I didn't elect. I didn't vote. But, you know, it's good for me because I go there, relax a little bit, scholarship for teaching, learning French, but away from the country a little bit because I don't like, like, Khmeru's leader die peacefully. But I'm very happy with our government. Even in the world, know that Cambodia is a corrupted country. But the thing that I appreciate Cambodia is we finished the war. The Prime Minister said that, okay, Khmerus, your leader died already. No need to continue the war. We stopped talking about who killed whom during the killing field time in the politics. What we need is peace. And me, I would like to have the world the same. Just stop the war and stop talking about who killed whom. One, two, three, stop. And I can tell you that you go to the war fighting to get peace, no way. No one stays there for you killing them to finish. You kill my father, I kill you, your children kill, what, kill me? My children kill you, kill your children, and your grandchildren kill my children, because of revenge. But I don't forgive to the, I don't forgive the people, the soldiers who kill my father. I judge them by different way. Okay, so anyway, when Khmerus finished, tourists started in our country. My town, very lucky, we have Angkor Wat. So tourists coming, they need a place to stay, to live, for going to 
temples. So we started to build the guest house called Seven Candles. Because of that, we say light the candles better than cursing the darkness. Because the past is the past, living in the future. In living now and forward to the future. So we build the seven candles step by step. We didn't build the whole house like this. We build little by little. So we pay the debt five times to get this building. Then all of us in the family, we speak Russian, we speak French, we speak English. We become the tour guide to look for the money to pay the debt, to pay the, pay the bank. Working in temple, we see some problem. What we concern very much is more and more children came to the temples to beg the money to sell the souvenir. At the beginning, the parent took the young one coming because no one take care. But the tourists put the risk in our country by, oh, you're so cute, give the money. You're so cute, one postcard that costs only $1, they give $20. I saw two American ladies like give the money like this. I asked my friend, so sound, a tour guy. And the, the guy for that, two ladies, oh, your, your guest, very kind. And he said that every morning, $3,000 he has to break into small pieces. It's good to give the money for people living. But giving the money for training the people to be the beggar, it's not. Me, I'm a teacher. I see the problem. So I keep thinking, talking with my tour guide people in the house. If we could have those tourists get the money to give inside the school, not in the road. Oh, give $10, you go to school. No, they pretended, oh, give me $10, I go to school. But if you give inside the school, that encourage the parent to send the children to go to school. That's our idea. So 2001, my dream start to become true. I could get one girl in my program. My family supported. And also some visitors who use me as a tour guide supported. Then 2001, the end of 2001, 40 children. By the end of 2005, I got more than 200 students in our program. And I could have some money to send them to the private English class because I thought that if they stop school, they could have some English to work in the, <coughs> in the restaurant or in the hotel. <coughs> the 31st of December 2005, I got a booking from a lady from Texas. Her name is Lori Carson. This is a picture of her. Of her. She's smiling. And her life changed. She joined me and she only one month after she visited Cambodia, she registered Punyeri Lee Foundation in Austin, Texas. And then our project grow very big, very fast. Some people who use me as tour guide and found the website and email me, Punyeri, what is Punyeri Lee Foundation? If we give the money to that, we send the money to Austin, our money is safe or not? I said, your money is me to spend. I use your money, not the people in Austin. When you reuse your money. And then the money drop in the box. And then we get many children in our program. 
So every year, we got that. Every year, we got almost 3,000 students in our program. And even though the foundation grow bigger and bigger, my family still involved with that, helping to do the bundles of supplies and uniforms for uh, the students. Uh, this year, we have 2,800 students. Then, 2010, I was nominated as a CNN hero, and I become one of the CNN hero, not CNN hero of the year, but one of them. A little bit more, get that, but okay, no problem. <laughs> and with this, show in the air, many people drop the money and make us like very heavy with the work, not for fun anymore, it became the serious work. We start to hire the staff, one after one until we are crowded. No, only 10 staff. We don't want to spend a lot of money for the staff. So we work with the government school. Then, um, 2016, we got the World of Children Award. Like we have the Nobel Prize for children that we got $80,000 to sponsor the children in the primary school. I went to New York to get that. <laughs> so I did. Yeah. So then I got the invitation to give a speech in UNESCO in Jakarta. My first speech abroad, I was shaking like this. I can tell you that millions, million times speaking, I'm still nervous, believe me. <laughs> because, like, okay. So, at the beginning, we think about the children in the primary school only. But when our students finished primary school, they came, oh, teacher Punyari, could you follow your help? Oh, uh, for us, when we arrive to secondary school, and then I talk to Lori. Lori said, "Yes, of course, do whatever you want." And then, okay. And when they finish high school, graduate high school, teacher Punyari, you could you give us the scholarship for university? Hmm, a lot of money. So we say yes to the best. The one who have the material of university in the brain, okay, you go. We gave them the money for living expense and also pay the university fee. But if they got very good score and then got the scholarship from the government for the school fee, for the fee so we gave them only living expense. And we had a meeting with them every year, twice or three times per year. And also we have the group for them to control each other. This year we have 90 students in the university. And among the 90 students, we have four medical doctors. No, for three medical doctors. We have one in year five and two in year four. The one in year five, he started his school when he was 10 years old, grade one. So now he's like 30 years old <laughs> in year five in university, but he's very strong. He doesn't have parents because of that. He starts his school very, very late, but that's okay. He struggled a lot. Education for everybody, for all age, not only young people and also education, not only in the school, everywhere you school. So we have many programs for them. 
we have the activities after school, English, because in pri primary school, no English. And also in the secondary school, only two hours or three hours per week for English, so not enough. So our foundation provides them English, computer, uh, and also has having some fun with music. I think music is beautiful, right? We have art and craft, we have many things for them. Um, also, in the poor area, if they don't have enough food, they cannot sit in the class for a long time. They cannot focus to their lesson. So our foundation provide them breakfast. And also, some school, one lunch, breakfast every morning, yeah? And one lunch per month, or three months, or three, or three times per month, depend on how poor it is. I can tell you that we are poor, poor, poorer, poorest, and extremely poor. We have many categories of poor. But we have also rich people who don't care about poverty. They don't think about anything. They think about money and power. But I don't want to insult the other people. Not good. <laughs> I want to, sometimes I have to tell myself, do whatever you can. Don't look to the others, right? So this is the computer, my deaf sister teaching. So we are very happy with all our program. I don't know what happened. I laugh like this. <laughs> you can imagine. You can tell by yourself why Bunyiri show the teeth like this and look at them. When they finish second, uh, when they finish primary school, they got one bicycle so that they can cycle to the secondary school. So, nothing in my life would have predict predicted that I would be standing here talking to you. I was raised with no wealth, no resources, no status. I was raised in the prison camp during the genocide, during the war. And my family was thrown into the poverty for over a decade. But, you know, in spite of this, or perhaps of this, of it, I was raised with the skill I needed to survive. I was, I was raised with a belief of the power of education. I don't tell you to get sympathy. I don't tell you my story to show my country in the dark, in the negative light. I simply tell my story because I am an example of what is possible when people are provided with an education. Although our life may hmm, seem very different, but I would like to, uh, I would like you to know that we have very much in common. All of us here today have benefited from education, right? Um, and then I urge you to go forward with purpose and use your intellect, your talent, your education to improve the condition of others because the world is full of challenges. And we need strong, smart, confident young people to lead the world into the bright future. But we must all work together to make the world as uh, it is and the world as it should be one and the same. And all of you here today are un 
are very important to close this gap. So, school is the answer. Thank you.